Okay, I guess we can get started now. It's a couple minutes after seven. Stick to our timeline. So good evening, everybody. We, uh, you're in for a real treat tonight. We have a group of panelists here that uh, are gonna knock your socks off. They are uh, coming to us to continue our parent empowerment program, uh, what we call our pep talks. Earlier in the year, we had some pep talks where we had our school psychologists on board and they were providing exceptional advice uh, for parents and supporting their children in these difficult times. If you didn't get a chance to see that, those videos are posted to our curriculum instruction page. I would encourage you to go back. I know as a parent of three boys myself, I learned a lot from them um, and uh, I encourage my wife to watch those videos and, and we had a great time with those. So if you haven't gotten to see those, make sure you go back and take a look at those. But tonight it's about supporting parents uh, of elementary students with the remote instruction process. So uh, I'm gonna stop speaking at some point and introduce you to the panel of experts here and they're gonna take it away. So Ms. McGuire, if you wanna start by introducing yourself and then maybe allow the panelists to introduce, introduce themselves and you can get started. Sure, thank you so much, Dr. Manning. My name is Teresa McGuire. I'm the Director of Pupil Personnel Services. And we also have... Hi, I'm Jen Washington. I'm a special education teacher at Thomas J. Leahy, and I'll be covering questions about Google Classroom. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bonnie Cheskis. I'm an occupational therapist here in Harborfield. Um, my background is originally in rehab, and I now work in TJL, OMS, and the high school. And I will be working on helping you with management of the workspace at the home. Hi everyone, I'm Christine Needham. I'm a board certified behavior analyst and I work at uh, Washington Drive in TJL as a behavior consultant. And I'll be answering any behavior related questions specifically related to schedules this week. Um, so I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, so I wanted to begin and just uh, give you a little background as to how we came to this place also. We had met with SEPTA and we received a lot of feedback in regard to how our parents uh, were supporting their children on virtual learning. Um, so we did come up with the videos and today we are going to be answering several questions. Um, I did wanna start out with just a few questions. Um, I'm just looking here, uh, let me see. I have one question uh, that was emailed to me that I wanted to review. And what we'll do is, you know, there are some questions that are kind of overlapping. So we have a, a person that's very well versed, Jen Washington with the Google Classroom. We also have Bonnie Cheskis who really sets up workspaces and helps our children with sensory concerns and really helps them attend to instruction to the screen. And we also have Christine Needham. So I think that when we're answering the questions, we wanna have a multidisciplinary approach. So I'm gonna read the first question. I know that a parent had emailed me, so I think it's a good starting place. So one of the questions that I had received was, how do I know what kind of schedule I should use for my child? Okay, so Christine. Okay, so when it comes to schedules, it really depends on your child, what their reading level is, um, what their ability level is, what they, you know, are able to attend to. So for a lot younger children, we like to use visual schedules, which are just pictures or icons to represent different subject areas or tasks that you want your child to complete. So we would put those pictures on a schedule in order of the tasks that you want them to complete. And once they're completed, either the child can remove the picture or put a check next to the picture to indicate that they've completed that task. If your child is a little bit older, we like to move them towards written schedules. Um, sometimes you can pair the activity with the time that they need to complete the activity um, at so that it teaches them time management skills as well. So you would list all of the activities you would have your child um, write them or you could write them out for your child and um, have a list of all the tasks they need, would need to complete for that day. And they would learn to check off the tasks as they go so that you could see the progression to indicate that they um, have completed each of those tasks. So it really depends on the level of the child and whether um, a visual schedule or a written schedule is something that would benefit them. <clears throat> and just to uh, piggyback on that, it's great that you mentioned, you know, the older students needing a written schedule because I know a lot of 
the teachers at Leahy are on the stream in Google Classroom every day, post the daily schedule. So for children that are, you know, let's say that day, they are virtual and they're not used to being in the virtual setting. The first thing that they should do is go onto the Google Classroom and check the stream because it's likely that the teacher would have posted a schedule for the day. Just to add to that as well with regards to schedules, um, just to be sure to be building in breaks into your child's schedule and helping them with that component. Um, I know that a lot of times when teachers post a schedule on Google Classroom, you can take that schedule and rewrite it and also include screen-free time or breaks um, into your child's schedule so that they can kind of have a reset, a little movement break in the day that's already built in and they can see that it's coming and part of their schedule. So it definitely helps to do that as well. I just want to remind parents that you can use the chat below. Um, I'm, go I'm going to be reviewing a lot of questions that we receive through emails um, since, you know, for the past few weeks since we've had and since we've had the video, but certainly feel as though uh, you can use the chat in case there's a question that's specific to your child. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting in the video was in the scheduling. Um, that sometimes what we want to do is parents have many different demands on them. Uh, you're at home with working with your child virtually, but you also might be working from home, which is very competing. So sometimes what we do is we look at the different, we might communicate with our teachers and say, you know, what, where do I really need to be attending to for my child? And maybe even schedule your own schedule around the needs of your child. So I thought that was something that we, uh, we really have learned throughout this process. And it is a learning process. As we go through all of these questions, um, we might be giving you answers that don't relate to your current situation and it's individualized. So if you have any follow-up questions, just let us know. Um, or if you see, if we answer a question that a parent had uh, through an email and you feel as though um, you want to follow up, just use the chat. Um, but another question that I did get was, um, how do I teach my child to follow that schedule independently? So you might set up a schedule, but then they're prompt dependent and they're relying upon you to structure that. So how do we get independence in following a schedule? So that's definitely a really good question and it is a challenge, especially for, you know, when it comes to the younger students, teaching them how to be independent with their schedule and not always rely on mom and dad to be prompting them through it. Um, with this situation, you do have to definitely start off slow. So you would um, maybe reinforce your child for following the first um, one or two tasks on the schedule by themselves. So you would say, you know, I'm gonna see how you're gonna follow your schedule today by yourself. You're gonna do the first two things by yourself and I'm gonna come and check in on you. And when you do that by yourself, you can earn a sticker, um, some free time with a preferred activity, whatever it is. So have them start you know, being independent with the beginning of their schedule, with the, you know, the first task on the task list. And as time goes on, you would slowly increase that um, to you know, two tasks independently, three tasks independently until they're following their schedule you know, pretty much for the full day independently and you're just checking in on them here or there. So it's a process and you need to start off slow and start off with, you know, one task or two tasks to begin with and slowly eventually build that time up. And we do that all the time in the classroom and we call that like building on success. So when we're looking for children to be independent, we'd rather for them to be independent if that's the goal for one activity rather than you prompting them through for, uh, for activities. So those are the things that we definitely focus on in the classroom as well. Um, so the, another question that I did have related to schedules is when do I build in those breaks? How long should that break be? So that's an interesting question. And uh, especially if we have children with special needs, um, that might vary quite a bit. Um, so for that, uh, definitely depends on the child and it depends on, you know, how much movement you feel your child needs, how long they can sit and tolerate. Some children can sit for quite a long time and attend and be completely fine and not need so many breaks. Other children would benefit from um, multiple shorter breaks during the day or 
um, a break immediately following an activity that they completed. It really depends on what works for you and for your child and for your child's schedule that day. So it could be a short break, which is a couple minutes away from the computer where you might do, you know, some yoga poses, some stretching, some deep breathing, or it could be um, several longer breaks. Maybe you have a built-in time um, in the schedule, in your child's schedule, where you can go for a little walk outside and get some fresh air, and it's a little bit of a longer break, and that just provides a reset for children, um, and it seems to be really helpful. And just to um, piggyback again, you know, a lot of the classroom teachers are giving you know, those more natural breaks during the day. So the in-person students in the elementary classes are getting those mask breaks. So we always try to remind the students, the students at our home, like this is a really great time to get up, move around, change the spot that you're sitting in because sitting in that same spot all day is a lot for the kids. And you know, even a child that may not think they need a break you know, at the end of the day, they're very tired. And, you know, I know from speaking from experience, when we are pushed into a virtual setting, it is, it is a tiring day. So just getting up out of their seat for a couple of minutes would really be beneficial for everybody. And just to piggyback on that also, Jen, so in the um, video I provided, I provided a bunch of really quick little simple movement breaks that you can do. Um, when I was virtual for a couple weeks, it was really hard on me. I don't have those breaks built into my day. I see students back to back. And by the end of the day, my back was hurting, my neck was hurting, my eyes were tired, I had a headache. And these are all complaints that we're hearing from our students. So super important to remember, do not underestimate the few seconds of movements. Jumping jacks, run in place, skip around the room, um, really great to always do what I always call heavy work, pushing something heavy, um, carrying the laundry basket, you know, to the laundry room, anything like that. Um, I, I mentioned windmills with their arms, gallop like a horse. I love doing a lot of obstacle courses or just quick movements, hop like a bunny, hop like a jump like a frog, gallop like a horse. All of those are terrific, quick little activities. Um, and a great reference is Go Noodle. And they have quick little dance videos that are two to three minutes long. And you can play them on the big screen if you have Roku or you have Apple Fire Stick or you can even do them just right on the Chromebook. And the kids can follow along and pick a music song that they like and they do a little dance routine. And it really kind of resets the brain and gets them ready to work and be able to focus for the next activity. I would also say, Bonnie, just even like looking in the classroom, we frequently will do that when we have our children, especially at the elementary level, that movement is definitely connected to their ability to attend. So when you're sitting in one spot and you're stagnant, your thoughts are stagnant too. Sometimes to increase alertness, as you were saying, we need those movement breaks. So building them into the schedule, also having appropriate activities paired in that schedule is key. I love it. Okay, so our next, uh, our next question that we had received was my child is complaining about headaches at the end of the day. Is there anything that I can do? This is a major concern and I cannot uh, even share enough how many parents are concerned about that screen time because it isn't a natural uh, environment. So what do we do to help our children um, with the visual component of attending to a screen and not a person all day? So I'm going to take that one. So there's a few things. So um, one thing that is very popular right now, you'll hear a lot of kids getting the blue light glasses. It's supposed to help with the um, emissions from the screen and looking at the light on the screen. And that's definitely one way to go. Um, an eye doctor, um, and they definitely recommend, the eye doctors recommend the 2020 rule. So if they're on the computer for 20 minutes, they should look away at something 20 feet away for at least 20 seconds. Now we're talking little ones. I honestly would do that a little bit longer. So just as kind of like a guideline. But then also on the computer, very basic, you can adjust the brightness of the screen. And what I always tell my students is definitely look at the font on their screen. You don't want them squinting and looking really closely at these little tiny screens. If they can make the writing bigger when they're working on something that they're writing in the Google Doc or in a Google Slide, make the writing bigger. It's easier on their eyes. It's easier for them to see the paperwork. And all of those are just little tricks, but you know, definitely thinking about font size. 
If it is something that they are complaining about often, TJL especially grade three to five is a very common year for kids to need glasses. So definitely if it is a common complaint, I would never rule out, just get them to the eye doctor and make sure that your kid is not that kid that suddenly needs glasses. And there is a greater need for kids to need glasses for near point looking at something close up than there ever was before. Um, this is not just from COVID, this has just been an ongoing trend. I think kids are in general are closer here, so their eye muscles um, do need those glasses sometimes sooner. And it's very common for them to need glasses to see far away. Um, so those would be some basic tricks. And then the last one, super important, is lighting when the students are working. Make sure that they're in a nice, well-lit area. Um, but you know, fluorescent lighting is always harder on the eyes than natural light. So all of those things are definitely helpful if your kid's really complaining with those headaches. Now, there are things that we don't even think about uh, that we do that kind of um, create new habits. So I'll give the example of my niece who I bought her those very glasses that you were talking about. So when she was on the computer, she always felt as though it was a special time. I have to get my glasses and she would get on her glasses and it became like just a new behavior to make it exciting too. So those are the type of things I was just thinking about also that make the virtual experience something special. They're not used to wearing those glasses, um, anything like that. Um, are there any other tips, Bonnie, that you that you see that might uh, help kids be more motivated in their workspace? I know I frequently get questions from parents about, you know, how do I set up a workspace? What does that look like? How do I really help my child um, get the most of this experience and really see that as the place that I learn in the house? Um, good question, Teresa. So super important that your kids are involved in their decisions in perhaps choosing the chair that they're going to sit in. Now, it is interesting. I know a lot of people who had kids with desks in their rooms before, and they were just on a regular hard wood chair that they were sitting in. Now the kid's sitting in that for six hours a day. It's a little different. So you do want to take a look, make sure that that chair is comfortable supporting your child. Um, you know, perhaps they want a more mature looking chair, a more fun chair, colorful chair. Um, you do also want to have them participate in organizing their space. Um, I have a chalkboard behind me, but I love the cork board or a magnetic board where they could have their calendar, their daily reminders for them that they have for the day. You know, today I have gym and art, or um, I have, you know, a special at such and such time, or I have to remember I'm taking a quiz tomorrow. So all of those are great reminders. Um, I am all about color coding. I got that from several teachers at TJL. I think a lot of the students associate that. So if science is green, the folder should be green, the loose leaf should be green, the notebook should be green, and then that all goes into one little space. So that definitely helps. Um, I even have students sometimes take notes in green. So it's just like that carryover of, you know, remembering what, you know, what subjects they're on and it kind of makes it a little fun and it, you know, personalize their space. I think again, lighting is super important and I do think super important not to have distractions. Parents don't realize, you know, TV on in the background is distracting. If there's multiple children in the home, if doors could be, you know, either closed or just open a little so that they're not hearing each other's Google Meets. Um, also helpful if there are multiple kids to have the noise canceling headphones so that they can really focus on the one teacher and the one classroom that they're in. Um, I'm personally very sensitive to noise. So if I hear something going by, I'm immediately looking, what was that? What is that? And then immediately I'm taken away from what I'm doing. So that's a lot of our learners, not, you know, wh whether they're special ed, not special ed, a lot of us have that. So super important for that. Um, and, you know, that's pretty much, you know, you do want to make sure workspace wise, I should address um, their desk space, their height of their desk and their height of their chair is very important. A lot of the kids desks are really not made for a kid that they're actually too tall for them. So you just want to make sure that their arms aren't up here while they're typing. If they are, you want to either lower the desk or raise the chair. But if you raise the chair, you have to raise the floor. So sometimes if you raise the chair, you need to give them either a step stool to put their feet on. Their feet shouldn't just be hanging in the air. So you want that supported. And then you want their hands just like you would at work. You don't want your, your wrist flexed all day long. You want them in a neutral position and you want your elbow in a neutral position so that your shoulders aren't working here and you're all cramped and trying to type. Um, so those would be like main super important um, pieces that I did work on in the video. If you want to take a look at, I had provided some pictures so you can reference that and hopefully that helps. 
Great. And what about our fidgety uh, learners? A lot of times we'll have children that are either fidgeting in the chair or parents are trying to get them you know, to attend um, and not fidget with things on the side. Uh, what can we do to help our children that are fidgety? So the fidgety children, um, they definitely exist. I'm a big fan. Um, if anybody ever uses um, a hairband, I like that on the wrist because it's not like a rubber band, so it's not pulley. It's something that's on them that's not dropping to the floor. I find kids sometimes will keep dropping their pen or their pencils. Something that's not mobile is great. Um, I sometimes also, I'm a big fan of rings or a bracelet. Um, they have little fidget rings that you can get on Amazon that kids can fidget with all day. We as adults don't notice, but we probably do that a lot too. Like I'll sometimes do that with my necklace or a ring or a bracelet, same kind of thing. Um, I am a big fan of gum as long as the gum stays in the mouth and they're not blowing bubbles. Adults use it all day long. We have a meeting, we've been up late, we want to focus a little, you know, I'm a sugar-free gum girl, but definitely that. A Tic Tac is also helpful. Ice cold water is really helpful to kind of stay on task. What are we working on? Um, another great one for focus is um, drinking something thick through a thin straw provides a lot of feedback. So like a yogurt drink through a thin little coffee stirrer straw um, is a great snack for the student and it gives them a lot of feedback and helps provide a little bit of that calming and fidgeting energy. And um, Obviously, if they're on mute, but I do also like crunchy snacks. So pretzels, apples, carrots, all of those will also help those fidgety learners kind of stay a little bit calmer and deep. Um, us as OTs in the classroom, you'll often see we kind of hide Velcro under the desk and inside the desk. They have hook and loop. Some of the kids do really well with that. Sometimes I'll even put a little of that Velcro right on the pencil or right on the pen. You can get at Home Depot, craft stores, everywhere sell Velcro nowadays. Um, so I'm a huge fan of some of those. And then the, the basic stress ball, and you can see those, you know, everywhere. They have the stress balls or the putty. Um, but again, you have to limit sometimes those fidget distractions too. Like some kids will be sitting there with the putty while they're on Zoom and <laughs> they're pulling the putty across. So there needs to be a time and place depending on the student. And you could say, you know, putty's for the break, but the bell is when you're paying attention in the class. Or here's some ice cold water if you need. So those things to just kind of help the students that they can function and focus, but that they're not also distracted as well. And once again, like you were just saying with the, the breaks, that overflow, overflows into the schedule. So you might have, if you're going to schedule those rewarding breaks or those sensory breaks, you can also, as Christine was saying, incorporate them into your schedule. So I did have another question that had uh, a parent had emailed me about, um, and it was more related to um, the Google Classroom and worrying about, you know, how do I keep track of assignments? How do I know that my child is handing them in? Um, so the question is, what is the easiest way to make sure my child is handing in their assignments? Okay, so... Well, first, any Google Classroom related question, I would definitely suggest checking out the video. I did take you through a live demonstration on how to use Google Classroom as a parent because I, I showed that student view. But the easiest way to help your child, and I do this with my own children, is to go into the Google Classroom, go, go in their account, go to Google Classroom, go to the classwork section, and then click view work. And when you click view work, you'll see a list of all of the assignments they should be completing. When they submit the assignment, when they turn it in, you will see that it says a little check next to it that they, that means they turned it in. If it's still assigned, they didn't turn it in yet, it will say assigned. Another good way to check that is when you go back to that classwork section, any assignment will be shaded out in gray. The assignments that are still outstanding will be bolded. So you'll, it's, you know, you kind of have two different areas to check. But I just know as a parent, when I'm checking my children, really the easiest way to do it is go to the classwork section, view work, because that list is just really easy to manage then. And you'll also see in that same section, anything that's missing. Thank you. Thank so you. I did have a parent that was concerned about how do I how do I teach my child, um, you know, when they're handing in their assignments. What if they, they what if they would put it in accidentally? What should the parent do um, 
to retrieve that, that assignment? How do they teach their child? So, and a lot of this too, that, you know, we, we're trying to teach as we go when we're, you know, as teachers, we're teaching the kids these steps for them to be more independent, but it's a process. So the best way, so if, if your child had to do something and you wanted to check it first, because I know what happens to me and my children are very quick to, su and, you know, submit their assignments, the best way to receive it back is to go into the classwork section go to view work, view that assignment. And then what you can do when you click view details, you can unsubmit. It's in the right, you'll see it on the right. You can just click unsubmit and then you'll have access back to that document. Because a lot of times kids think, or you know, we'll think that we have to email the teacher because you, the kid will, your child will not be able to access that assignment unless you unsubmit it. So hopefully that helps, you know, it might take a time or two just to practice unsubmitting. I did cover that in the video. So if you do watch it, you'll see I did demonstrate that section there. That's a good question though. It happened, it does happen, it does happen often. <laughs> okay, and if you have any questions about that, certainly reach out to your classroom teacher. Um, they can assist you if this is happening frequently to, because that then becomes a goal for your child to learn a virtual skill uh, in the Google Classroom. So another question is, um, sometimes children don't like to ask questions in front of other students. So is there a way that the child can communicate privately with their teacher? Okay, so another great question. In the Google Classroom, there are, there are two different areas where you can chat with a teacher. The one area is called um, a class comment, where you can post comments on the stream. However, a lot of teachers disable that option because it'll turn into an area where kids are posting comments and not necessarily academic related. So what we suggest is to use the private comment feature. And that's a great way to have a dialogue with the teacher. Let's say your child was confused about one of the assignments, maybe they submitted, but they really weren't quite sure about it. All they have to do is, again, go to classwork, view, view, view details of that assignment, and they, you'll see the private comment will appear on the bottom right. They can then initiate that private comment with the teacher, and that will only be between the child and the teacher, not the class. Okay, and do you find that that happens frequently that parents are communicate, you know, teaching their children to communicate directly with the teacher, which I think is a great skill, even at an elementary level? So definitely, you know, I can speak for fifth grade. We do have kids that use, they do use it and the fifth graders are using it, I think independently, a lot of them are using it independently from their parents. I can speak as a parent and tell you, last year, my, my daughter in first grade, I was really helping her or I was writing the comment and she was kind of, you know, we have to think about the different ages. You know, I was writing the comment because I noticed she was having difficulty with the assignment and we, together we wrote that comment. So I think that depending on the age, I think, you know, we'll teach the children to become independent with their comments. Um, and it might look different depending on the grade level. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you. So looking at, uh, you know, this is, this is new to all of us and we're learning together. Um, looking at the beginning of the year and from September to now, um, as the professionals that are working with students, what is the most frequent um, obstacle or challenge that you have found for your students that are learning virtually? Um, and what advice would you give to parents to overcome that? Because it's probably, there are common uh, areas that all children are struggling with. Um, so if you can think of one piece of advice that you would give parents to support their children at home, uh, what would that be from all of your different perspectives? So we have Bonnie Cheskis who really works on uh, looking at the, the sensory needs, the fine motor needs, um, the visual spatial awareness. There's just so many pieces just to OT, occupational therapy in itself. 
um, Christine, you're always focusing on how do I motivate a child? How do I um, help a child understand um, expectations, which in the virtual learning world now, it's, it's the expectations are, are changing as we go, um, as we grow. Um, and then Jen, you are really looking at the Google Classroom, presenting activities, teaching in a very different way. For the students that are virtual, whether it be hybrid or all virtual, um, I just want you to think of one skill or, or one common obstacle and how can we support parents uh, in that area? Maybe we'll, we'll just start out with you, Christine. Sure. So one common obstacle that I keep hearing about is um, how do I motivate my child to want to sign into online learning? And, you know, we see this from the really little ones to the ones that are a little bit older. Um, finding that motivation is definitely tricky. Um, I would ask the parents to really examine what their children like and what they enjoy learning. For some of them, it's the iPad. For some of them, it's a special toy or activity and use that as motivation um, and then find a positive reinforcement system, whether it's a sticker chart or um, a token board. And I'll go into this more in future presentations, but some kind of quick, easy, positive reinforcement system where you set up the behavior expectations that you want your child to engage in, whether it's logging on, participating, sitting appropriately, attending, those are the things that you want them to be doing during online learning. Those are the things that you're gonna be reinforcing with checks, tokens, stickers, whatever it may be. And once they reach a certain criteria, so whether some students earn five tokens, some students earn three stars, it depends on what it is. You can um, figure that out, whatever works best for your child. But once they earn that, that criteria of reinforcement, then they earn the reinforcer, meaning they earn that, that preferred activity, the iPad time, the preferred toy. And once you really find that motivation and you have that positive reinforcement system in, in place, it definitely helps to, to motivate your child to attend. Thank you. And Bonnie? I think for me, the toughest one that I see a lot is how do I get my kids to stay focused and um, attend to the classroom setting? And I think it's super important to really set up an expected workspace. If your child needs support, they shouldn't be sitting by themselves in their room because then it's hard for them to get support. So perhaps that child would be much better suited having a workspace set up in the dining room or the kitchen, maybe not in the central location of the house, but where you can kind of check in and see if they need any assistance because then you're there to kind of help them refocus. Um, if your child's a totally independent learner, even that student, it's important to kind of just check in with them every you know, half hour or so, how's it going? Now, listen, I know um, a lot of the kids, especially those fifth graders and up, they don't want their parents going anywhere near the Google Classroom. They don't even want their parents walking by the door. And I get that, but you can set up the Chromebook so that the parent could perhaps peek in, the child's muted and you can just check in, do you need anything, how's it going? And so that way, if they need support, there's somebody there to help them out. So that's really the big one. So really kind of set up. and. It might only be that your child needs support just during math. So they could have a math space and then they can work in their room for those other times. Or they might just need help when they're doing science. So during science, they're in a more central location, but then they're in their room for their other space. Um, and then some kids don't need that piece of support, but really just need to know that this is where you work. We don't sit in the bed. We don't wear pajamas. Their screen is on, the camera's on, and you're muted and you're ready to go for a class. Because again, if you're learning at home, your expectation is you're still in school. And if the parents support that, uh, then the child knows that that's the expectation. And then they're going to feel like they're a participant learning in the school. So that's really, you know, the big one that I find if they need support, just having someone nearby. And believe me, I get it. I'm juggling at home too. So I know sometimes it's hard as a working parent to provide that support in that moment. So you sort of have to juggle, juggle that also. Um, and th those are the pieces that I find really helpful. Thank you, Bonnie. And Jen. Okay, so, you know, I guess I, I, I'll really touch upon two things. Kind of similar to what um, Bonnie was saying, you know, one of the, I guess, main struggles that I do hear about is engagement with the technology. So part of that is, you know, keeping that camera on and also knowing when it's an appropriate time to turn that camera off. So in the elementary setting, 
you know, we're, we, we're not expecting that they're at the computer, you know, for the entire day. However, their cameras should be on when the classroom teacher is instructing. So that's when the, the camera should be on and we are encouraging that child to um, participate in the lesson. Now we are talking about breaks during the day and that when the child is ready for independent work, a good time to you know, take that camera off would be, okay, that's the time where I'm gonna maybe move where I'm sitting, work on my assignment independently, and then I'm gonna turn my camera off, but then I'm gonna turn it back on when I'm ready to engage back with the class. So just knowing when it's an appropriate time to have that camera on and have that camera off. And then the other one, as far as technology goes, what I covered really, I mean, the, the main piece that I hear from teachers is making sure kids know how to turn in their assignments because kids will do their assignments, but they don't always go to that final step of turning in their assignment. I did cover how to turn in assignments on the video. So if you need to review that, um, you can for sure even review it with your child if you know they're having difficulty in that area. And as teachers, we are instructing the kids and we are going over how to go in the Google Classroom and turn in assignments. And we're gonna continue instructing them in that area as well. That's very good. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, so I would like to just review a lot, as I said in the beginning, a lot of our um, topics overlap between special education teacher, assistive tech and occupational therapy, and we have a, a behavioral consultant view. So our upcoming videos, we have another two videos coming with a, a discussion forum to follow. We're going to get into more detail into each area. So the next video will be really looking at the prompting and the redirection. Like we touched upon that today, you know, how do we get our children to attend longer and become more independent uh, with the virtual learning? And we're really going to be getting more into detail about the assistive technology and the Chrome extensions that teachers are using. So you can benefit from them too as parents in the home setting. Uh, the last video we'll be working upon and Christine kind of touched upon that when I asked like, what is the biggest concern parents have? Really it's motivation. How do we get our children to keep motivated when, when they're learning new things in a new way? So the positive reinforcement techniques and looking at Chromebook uh, tips and tricks. Um, so we will be coming out with uh, two more videos with discussion forums and we really encourage you uh, to view those videos. We are here for you. Um, we're setting up these videos and these discussion forums. We'll, we're open to your feedback. So if in the future there's something that you feel that we can do to support you, please reach out to us at PPS, reach out to your classroom teachers, um, we're here to support you. And I'm just going to pass this off to Dr. Manning. And I would like to thank Dr. Manning for always supporting us and for really encouraging us to do this and collaborate and support our parents. Thank you. No, thank you, uh, Ms. McGuire and uh, our panelists here. You are all uh, doing such wonderful work. And like I said at the beginning, you were in for a real treat and I didn't, uh, the group didn't let you down. You certainly uh, provided a wealth of information. And the good thing about this is that this webinar was recorded. So we're gonna post this to the website uh, for our parents to view at their, at their pleasure uh, going forward. And for anybody who didn't get an opportunity to see this tonight. So again, I wanna thank each of you for, for doing this program uh, because it is just, it's so valuable. Uh, as a parent myself, again, like with three young children in school and this whole hybrid environment, uh, it's, it's a challenge. And so every one of us, can certainly use the support that you're providing and I really do appreciate it. So thank you for that. Um, as you, all of you would know in the community, the flyer for these presentations, both the elementary presentations and the secondary presentation is posted to the Google, I'm sorry, to the Harborfields website, curriculum and instruction website. So it's on there, I encourage you to visit that flyer if you didn't uh, see it already and make sure you mark those future dates on your calendar. And then as was, uh, referenced several times. There are videos posted to that website as well, so you can go and, and view those. So thank you again, everybody, for your time, uh, and I hope you, I certainly enjoyed this, this presentation. Um, so with that, I'll say good night, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you.